Hey everyone, we're starting a new chapter now, which is chapter six or topic six, and this is gonna be on the concept of thermodynamics and thermochemistry. What is this chapter studying? What are we talking about here? So we're talking about the nature of energy and its relationship to chemical reactions. And specifically, we're going to talk about how chemical reactions can be used to generate energy, or sometimes we can use energy to cause a chemical reaction to occur and the way we're going to do that is a lot of times by determining the amount of heat that is transferred during that particular chemical reaction. Well, there's many many applications to this because energy surrounds all of the things we do in everyday life. For example we use energy every day to heat different things right whether it's our water or to cook or to heat our house. We also need energy to sustain ourselves in every everyday living. So in biology, energy is a very important component. And of course, in industry, we use energy for all kinds of things to run our cars, factories, uh, as we know it, and how to create energy sustainably and clean energy, of course, are things that we would have to understand if we're going to go further into chemistry, physics, or engineering. Okay, so before we can actually talk about how to calculate the amount of energy in a chemical reaction, we need to first understand some basic terminologies in thermodynamics. So thermodynamics itself means the study of energy, but we're going to really focus on developing the ideas in thermochemistry, which is thermodynamics applied to chemical reactions. In thermodynamics, there are three different things that we need to pay attention to. One is something called the system, and the system is the substance or the object that is undergoing chemical or physical change. In thermochemistry, our system is the reaction itself, the reactants and the product. So we're interested in what happens in terms of energy when our reaction takes place. Now in terms of systems, there's three different types. There's something called an open system, which is a system that allows the transfer of both matter and energy. An example of this would be, say, if you have a mug of coffee, the coffee can spill out or dust, particles, etc. can land on the coffee. So that's matter. The heat from the liquid can escape from the coffee into the surrounding air. So that's a change in the energy. So energy and matter can easily go in or out in that system. For a more chemistry example, it will be something like a test tube that doesn't have a cork on it, and there's a chemical reaction that's going on inside the test tube. So again, matter and heat can go in or out from that chemical reaction. A closed system is one that we also experience very often in chemistry. And an example of this would be the same test tube, but now you cork it or you put a cover on it, and that will now not allow any of the gases to escape if your reaction produces gases. The energy on the other hand still can escape. It can still go in from the outside through the glass of the test tube. Energy can pass through that and come into the test tube or go out from the test tube. When you hold the test tube you can feel the test tube getting warmer or colder depending on what kind of reaction you happen to be dealing with. The isolated system in the sense of thermodynamics a system that doesn't allow any kind of transfer of matter or energy and the best approximation to this is a thermos. So if you put a warm liquid in a thermos, it does stay warm for a long time because it's been designed to keep matter and energy to stay inside. Now even the best designed thermos will eventually lose its energy, so matter might not escape but energy will eventually escape. It might take a very long time though for that to happen, so you can assume that that's an isolated system for a given period of time. The surrounding is what this system is exchanging energy and matter with. If a chemical reaction is your system, then the surrounding could be really the components of your apparatus. The test tube itself is the surrounding. In fact, a lot of times if you're looking at reactants and products as your system, you know, if you have water surrounding that reaction, the water itself is your surrounding. So the solvent is the surrounding, whereas the solute, which is the actual reactants and products, are the systems. So a lot of times the surrounding is really, really uh, intimately tied with the system and is something that we need to be able to distinguish from the system later on when we do calculations associated with calorimetry. The universe here in thermodynamics is really talking about the thermodynamic universe, which is just the sum of things that are happening in the system and the surrounding both. Now, obviously, energy is a very important component in thermodynamics. So first thing we need to understand is how do we define energy? So energy typically is defined as the capacity to do work. So the idea is that if something has energy, you can use that thing to do something else. And the original idea was 
proposed a long time ago by a person called Leibniz, which sort of see that object has something he termed living force, then that living force can be transferred and can be used to do something else. So for example, if you throw a ball and the ball hits another ball, for example, that second ball now starts moving even though it was stationary before. The first ball must be transferring this living force to the second ball. And that was the beginning definition of energy. So now we understand that what this first ball is doing to the second ball is it's working on the second ball. It's doing work. Work here has a very specific definition in physics, which is to move an object a certain distance away. We'll talk a little bit more about work later on, but that's the idea of energy. There's different types of energy that we can talk about, but the main way we differentiate energy is in two different types. One is one we call kinetic energy, which if you recall is something we studied before in the gas chapter. Kinetic energy is any energy that's associated with things that are moving. The things that are moving could be a car, it could be a human being, could be an animal, could be a rock, could be as small as electrons. So anything that's moving is going to have kinetic energy associated with it. Now specifically when we talk about molecules that are moving randomly and we can measure the temperature of that sample of molecules, that kinetic energy of associated with molecular motion is called thermal energy. It's called thermal because the energy can be correlated to temperature as you may recall from the gas chapter we have an equation that says the kinetic energy of one mole of a gas particle is equal to three halves RT, the ideal gas constant times its Kelvin temperature. Now potential energy is the energy that results from where a molecule is, its position, or its condition, or its composition. So if you have H and O, for example, it's not going to have the same potential energy as having N and O or um, C and O. Different types of composition of molecules result in different types of potential energy. Potential energy comes about because of forces that exist between objects. That forces could be electrostatic forces, it could be gravitational forces, could be nuclear forces. There's these fundamental forces that are studied more comprehensively in physics that exist in objects with masses. And so these forces govern how things work in our universe and the existence of these forces is what results in potential energy. What kind of units do we use for calculating energy? Well, there's two main ones that you'll see, joule and calories. So joule is the SI unit, which is defined as the amount of force multiplied by distance. So force is given the unit of Newton, uh, distance given the unit of meter in SI. So one Newton meter is a joule. Now that unit is not that useful in chemistry. So you will just see joule or you often will see kilogram meter square per second square. That's how you break down Newton meter. Kilogram meter square per second square will be useful in certain applications of the unit joule because we need to do calculations for speed sometimes or for masses and so understanding that joule is also equal to that basic SI units is going to be important. Calorie is the original definition of energy. It's fairly simply defined as the energy needed to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if you have a gram of water, maybe just like a, a really tiny cup of water and you microwave it so that its temperature goes goes from let's say 24 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius, the amount of energy that that microwave has transferred into the water is exactly one calorie. It's not a big number. So typically when we're talking about food, we're really talking about kilocalories or kilojoules. That's the sort of the quantity of energy that we're typically are dealing with in everyday life. So the conversion between calorie and joules is given right here, but you'll be given that as well in your quizzes and exams. So one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. When you're looking at a molecule, a particle, a compound, ionic compound, or a molecule in a certain sample, like a test tube, for example, that sample really has a bunch of particles in them. The particles have both potential and kinetic energy. And potential energy comes from the different types of interactions in chemical bonds, intermolecular attractions between one particle and another particle that exists. And then the kinetic energy comes from the movement, all kinds of movement that can occur within a molecule at a given temperature. So the movement can be translational, where they're moving from one location to another, rotational, where they're just kind of moving around their own uh, center of mass, or vibrational, which is movement around the bonds. Okay, so both energies exist, and what we do is to know the energy of a given sample, what we do is we add all the kinetic and potential energies that exist for that sample, and we call that energy the internal energy of the system. The symbol for that is E that we're going to use here, although in some textbooks you'll see that symbol U 
true being used as well, but we're going to use E here. Now, the first thing about energy to remember is something called the law of conservation of energy, which is often also called the first law of thermodynamics. We're saying the thermodynamic universe, right? Energy never can be created or destroyed. Another way to say that is energy is conserved, okay? So the total energy of the system plus the surrounding, which is the universe, is constant. So you might say, well, you know, I see if I were to drop a book, for example, that the book stops moving. So isn't the energy gone at that point, the energy of the book when I was dropping it? Well, when the book is moving, as it's dropping down, it has certain kinetic energy, obviously, because it's moving. But when it's falls to the bottom, doesn't all the kinetic energy disappear? It's true, the kinetic energy disappears, but it doesn't disappear in the sense that it's gone from the universe. It's actually getting transferred to other things around the book. So where is it transferred to? Well, the floor, that's the one place where it's transferred to, right? The air surrounding the book. If you can measure the temperature of the air surrounding the book, you'll find that the temperature is a little warmer as a result of the book falling down because some heat is flowing from the book out into the, uh, the air as well as the floor. So another way to write this mathematically is to say the energy of the universe is equal to a constant. You can also say that the energy of the systems plus the energy of the surrounding is always a constant number. Now if the energy is constant, what does it mean about the change in the energy of the universe? Well that means that the energy, the change must also be zero, right? Must be zero because if all these processes that occur, dropping that book doesn't cause any difference in the energy of the, the total energy of the universe, that means the change, the energy of the universe must be zero. So another way to say that is the change in the system plus the change in the surrounding of the energy should be zero as well, okay?